There were so many times, I mean like more than 10 times, that my dad would quit breathing. It was like sometimes really obvious that he was going to heaven. And like there were some of the times that he was gone and didn't seem to be conscious of the fact that he was speaking out loud. I leaned over and I'm like, have you gone to the other side? Come on, tell me. And he's like, no, I, I don't feel like I'm supposed to say what I saw. And he's like, well, I can tell you this. It's all just so much more simple than we make it. And he just breaks out in the biggest smile, like a little bit teary. He's like, yeah. God really loves me. With us now we have Pastor Buddy Hoffman. He's the senior pastor of the Grace Fellowship Church. There was a season the Lord was really moving in our young people. There were some people that didn't like that. Threats were made and Buddy would just laugh. Should I do this in Buddy voice? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> they think this is gonna stop me. When we started Grace in 1983, there's two things that I was sure of. We were going to make disciples. We're going to teach the Bible. Even if you disagreed, you couldn't help just love him because the guy, he really was like pretty likable. When I got around Buddy, I felt like the life following Jesus should be the greatest adventure that you could ever live out. I remember him being like, if you can't say no to me, you're not going to be able to say no to other people. Yell no at me. I'm like, Dad, you're a pastor. You're going to get yourself arrested. We are not in war with the next generation. We are in war for the next generation. Buddy talked about, you know, going beyond the walls of the church. We are in war for the nations. So we went over to Iraq. Buddy got us arrested. They put him down, and he stood back up this. Charge us or let us go, you know. I said, shut up, man. We are in war for our communities. You can attend any church, but the real life comes when you're actually connected to a community, where Christ is the center of that community and watch your life elevate. Some of you have this idea that this is Buddy's church. Let me tell you something, if this is Buddy's church, we are in such serious trouble. I really don't have anything to give you than Jesus, and I don't have anything in me that's worth giving but Jesus. And you know what? You can get him just as good as I can. That was awesome. That was perfect. That's all I got. <laughs>
and the gap can be pretty far between those things. The Grace family just tears that division down. It says, no, this is who we are. We are the church. It graded against some people because, you know, they don't want to be uh, that transparent, that authentic, but Buddy, he doesn't stand for that stuff. be like, we need to go to Waffle House. I mean, I never thought a church person, let alone a church leader, like, actually had a good time. Buddy gave me a picture of a different kind of leader that gave me hope of, like, you can be yourself. You don't have to play by the rules. <laughs> that concept of grace and just being okay with your brokenness, your need for God. I mean, I don't think I would have known what was possible without experiencing his life. You know, every story has a story behind the story. We started in the Bible College in 1973. When Buddy and I would talk, I was so surprised that it turned into anything more than a friendship. I already had in my mind that I was going to marry somebody taller, so I kind of just dismissed him as not somebody I would marry. But because I did, I could so be myself and just tell him really what I was thinking instead of trying to impress him. And he was so himself. 1976 was the year that we got married. With $500 from our wedding, we went out to Boise, believing that we were just gonna like help a city become believers. When Jody and I graduated college, God had laid on my heart to go plant a church in Boise, Idaho. I started telling my friends that we were gonna go start a church in Boise, and they would say, you don't know anybody, you, you don't know a church there, you don't have any money, you're just gonna drive out there. This doesn't sound like faith. This sounds like you're crazy. We drove from Atlanta originally to Wisconsin and then across the northern half of the United States out to Boise. And it was the longest drive in the world. We would go for hours and hours without seeing anybody or anything. When Jody and I drove to Boise, Idaho, and there's two things that I was sure of. We were gonna make disciples, we're gonna teach the Bible. He said that if it didn't go well, that we would sell the car, get in a plane, and fly home. And he would go to work for somebody. That if God can't pay the bills, then I'm gonna work for somebody that will. Then we drove up onto the edge of the city and there was an old building there that looked like maybe at some time had been a church and we pulled into the place and we pulled around back of the building and a couple was pulling weeds out from around the door and I rolled the window down and I said is this a church and the man looked up at me and he said no but we wish it was I said, really? He said, yeah, we've been praying for three years that God would send somebody here to, to be a pastor and lead us. And I'm thinking, hey, God's got a plan. Maybe this was gonna turn into something we believed, but we didn't know. Like, you don't really know. You just do what you think God's telling you to do. It was six and a half, seven years later. One night, he woke me up in the middle of the night and just said, I had a dream and I think God wants us to go back to Atlanta. He didn't have a hard time leaving the things behind, but you look forward to the next thing that God's calling you to and how he's gonna speak to those people. And I was like, we're really happy here. Like, all the things that we've been wanting to do are happening. Why would we leave now? And he said, oh, Jody, that's the only time you can leave is when everything is going really well. We would never leave if things weren't going well. He resigned, packed a U-Haul, and drove back to Atlanta with two kids and started 
Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. Thank you, Lord, uh, for this group of people. Bless this food. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I would always say that we had five children. And they were like, if anybody else was in the room, they'd be like, you have five children. I'm like, I only, we only know three of them. And I'd say, well, first we had um, Treasure Valley out in Idaho. And then we had Gabe. Then we had Joy. And then we had Grace. And then we had Spring. But if you've ever had kids and you've had that spacing where when they're born, everything is about them being born. And that's what church was. Like when we first had a, a church, it was all about that. When I think about y'all doing what you're doing and where you're at, I think about where when we were, all this was the only size we were, um, all the way back in 1983. Our first gathering was in a daycare center. We just talked to people and invited people and, and every week you'd be like, there's a car, there's two cars. Like, whoa, we're, it's happening, we're gonna make it. It wasn't ever, hey, here we are and 500 people showed up. It was pitifully slow. When we first moved down south, the church was very much in the grips of legalism. Religion for the sake of rules. It looks every bit like what the Pharisees set up in the first century where it's like, hey, here's all the things you need to do in order to make God like you. If it's the church's job to then represent who God is to the world, yeah, it's gotta be us looking like this Jesus. He's flipping the tables, right? And the, the table flipping was actually about anger towards people being kept out. Dad grew up breaking all the rules and getting in trouble for knowing that some rules are really meant to be broken. Some boundaries need to be pushed. I think he loved the breaking the rules part of what God would do. Because we had been raised Baptist and we only knew Baptist, we just became Baptist. And later on, really felt like God was talking to us about dropping the Baptist name. He said, let's just be a church that teaches the Bible. So Grace became not just a name, it was a way of life. time that you spent around the, the table and around fires and on mountains praying and talking with his disciples, you take those out, you're, you're, you're missing half the Gospels. Mm -hmm. So if that's the context mm -hmm. that this is all happening within, like how can we, how can we have the same experiences without walking yeah. with yeah. other people in a deep, authentic way and walking with God? We so often think about Jesus' context of his ministry in the crowds. Mm -hmm. His context was depth. But our context is crowds. And so we have to like somehow change our context. Like I feel like that is the essence of, of what church is and what the church has to offer. To be like, hey, you're feeling lonely, isolated, addicted, being shaped by these outside things. Like come in this space, actually experience some liberty, some authentic conversation. Like this is what we've always been good at. Like we need to just be who we are. When you see in the Bible, oikos, that's family. And it means households. It means extended families. It means people who know people. Everybody here needs people that, 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 that is beyond just you and your family and your kids, girlfriends that you can talk to, girls, ladies, guys that can, you can talk to, extended communities that are real and vital. Someone has to be the light. Someone has to be kingdom-minded and kingdom-focused 
in every aspect of the word. And I believe that that's so important. People are looking for a genuine connection. They're looking to do life on life with people. It's about sitting down at the table, having a meal, getting to know one another. I don't have to walk around in the community with a Bible, with a chain on my neck, with a cross on it, and I don't have to speak scriptures, you know, all the scriptures in all the Bible. All I have to do is to be me. So my best friend is this guy named Tyler, and we went to college together, and he had just gotten hired by Grace to be their high school pastor. And so that's the first time I met Buddy. I remember the first question he asked me was, uh, what are you passionate about? So I told him, passionate about kids that, and kids that don't know Jesus. And he was like, said he could find something for me to do. We had some people coming on staff that dad was trying to figure out how to get them on staff and to how do you pay for somebody when you don't have a lot of money? And so I was like, hey, why don't you come live in my basement for a number of months and save up some money for a down payment? And so he did that with a couple different people on staff. So the real strategy there was him trying to figure out how to make it work with not a lot of money. So he invited me and Tyler to come move into his basement and that began our journey with Grace. You know, sometimes people think living in Buddy's basement was this big spiritual experience. You know, we're doing Bible studies every morning. No, it was just life. Buddy gave us a lot of leeway. In their mentoring, we were just mentoring them to become Christian leaders, pastors. We didn't have any plan. It really just felt like we were part of the family. And so we'd go to dinner together, he'd invite us to breakfast. Buddy preparing a sermon was kind of an art form. He had this distinct walk, and since we lived in the basement, you could, you, he had polio as a child, and so he had this sort of limp, and so you could always tell when Buddy was walking around upstairs. I'd go outside, and, and I knew he'd be working on something, but the way he'd be working on it, he'd be just sitting there in his jeans, no shirt on, he's got his pellet gun, and I had never considered that it was a good way to prepare for a sermon. We had been living with Buddy and Jody for about I don't know, three or four months, and hadn't read one book together, hadn't done one notebook together, not filled in any blanks. And, uh, and so he said, they're like, buddy, we're just wondering, when, when are you gonna start discipling us? He paused and kind of leaned back and he's like, you remember uh, last week when I woke you up in the middle of the night and we went to this family's house, I had just experienced this tragedy. Like, yeah. Remember how last night we went together and got fried chicken and with our family? Yeah. Remember how this morning I took you to go get bagels and we talked about my sermon? Yeah. Like, I have been discipling you. And it, really in that moment I realized it's like, no, no, what he's inviting us into isn't to go through a book together, but to see his life and to live life with him. And that honestly changed everything for me in regards to what it meant to do ministry. But there's something caught in all of that. It was never taught. But he just said, here, come look at my life. And not all of it was uh, particularly polished, but it was real. And there was something about that realness in Buddy that was really attractive. And if you're here and you don't have a Bible with you now, slip up your hand. We're gonna put a Bible in your hand. He was all about building the kingdom of God. And so he didn't care about it getting messy. He knew actually it would have to get messy to really build the kingdom of God. And so. Because of that, um, he would just take chances on leaders and especially young leaders. If you need a Bible, put your hand up in the air and somebody will give you a Bible. You can. Uh, and I think that's what happens when we're given space is something starts to come to life in us, in, inside of us, and we start to learn a new level of dependence on the Spirit when we step into leadership. Buddy just said, God's going to do amazing things here. I believe God's going to do amazing things. And I would love for you to come and be a part of this. Buddy sold us on a dream and God did incredible things. Now Thomas and all my friends around me, just to, um, to follow God and follow his footsteps, just um, read the book. Maybe you'll um, understand what he's saying. It's kind of confusing, but if you ask, uh, ask one of your uh, fellow friends that knows knows him very well or ask a fellow um, preacher like uh, Pastor uh, Buddy and um, if you if you just ask someone about it I guarantee you that you'll um, you'll figure it out.
And, um, where's Buddy at? I'm right here. Here, get a, um, little film of Buddy. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a great preacher. If you need to, um, figure him out, just go and ask him. <laughs> you know, you're very funny. A, a young man had cancer. His name is Jesse Smith. And there was revival among young people. Just, there was this fervor of the Holy Spirit that was happening. I fully believe grace would not be grace had Jesse Smith not died. Jesse got, uh, had a brain tumor, and there was something unusual about Jesse. Before I go, I won't, won't um, be afraid, because I know where I'm going. I know I'm going up to, up to heaven. So going up to heaven, what's there to be worried about? Jesse had a maturity that was beyond his years. When it came about two weeks out for Jesse to die, the doctor said, there's nothing you can do. I remember saying, Jesse, is it, what can we do? And he goes, I, I want to have my funeral over at the high school on the baseball field. I want you to put my casket on a home plate. And I want you to tell people that I'm safe at home and how they can be too. If you had the chance, Jesse, if we could make this record, you get a chance to speak to hundreds of thousands of kids. They hear, they hear what you want to say. What would you want them to know about what you've I gone would, through? I would, I would want them to know that Jesus Christ is your Savior, and even if you don't believe much in Jesus, I'm telling you, he's, he's the creator of this earth. He died for us. I said, Jesse, I, I don't think they're going to let us do a funeral at the high school. I said, you know, it's the whole, they wouldn't let us pray over there. He said, but you will ask, won't you? I said, yeah, I'll go by and I'll ask. And they let us do it. Hundreds of kids got saved. And out of that came our passion for the next generation. What comes out of that is that Buddy starts discipling the kids himself because there's no youth leader that he's feeling good about. Do you understand that we as a church, we do not play defense. We play offense. We are not some embattled group of people where we gather together and we kind of hope we can keep the world out. We're not the prey. We're the predator. We were moving from that place of almost a Pentecost to planting, to discipling. He says to these high school kids, maybe six, like there's not many, and he says, hey, how about I do the Bible study with y'all. And I was like, yes, you do a Bible study with us? Like, that would be really great. We'd love that. I'm not worried about the world getting my kids. I want to raise some kids. The world is worried about our kids getting their kids. He said, okay, you pick a time, and then I'll, I'll lead you. And then what I want you to do then is take what I tell you, and you teach it to some middle school kids. We're not worried about, so, you know, you better not uh, send your kid over to that public school because they'll, they'll indoctrinate them. No, they won't. We'll take it over. They're like, yeah, let's do it. And so we started with maybe those 10, 15 kids. It grew like maybe either 6 to 10 to 15. So that was probably September by spring was 92 kids at 5.30 in the morning. We got school teachers out there. We got principals out there. We got all kinds of people out there that are walking the halls praying for those kids. We got kids that are having Bible studies in those kids. We have kids' life programs. We are training up a generation to reach the next generation. I remember the first time I heard Buddy's voice um, when I was visiting as a senior in high school. And I remember, I mean, I remember being like, this voice, this is so odd. Our behavior brings believability to our beliefs. Southern. Nobody had to bribe me to marry Jody. 
I thought I was gonna have to bribe her to marry me. Anytime Buddy got going in a story, his octave level would just skyrocket. How many of you believe Baptists need to be evangelized? Yes! Every person on the team tried to impersonate him. Um, I did a few times in front of him, and he would always chuckle. He'd always say people's names wrong, too, to like get yeah. attention or something. He'd say, Mother Teresa. We might read Mother Teresa, but most of us don't want to be. Mother Teresa. <laughs> it's like, no, it's Mother Teresa. I remember Buddy one time teaching me how to speak. He called me Raymond and said, Raymond, it's like this. You gotta breathe in and then talk from here. Like, when you're speaking, you have to grab people that you can only hold their attention for so long, and then you have to let them go. But then you right. grab them back and let them go. So if he, if he was sensing that people weren't with him, he would just tell some random story. So many of the biggest breakthroughs on a personal level and on a church level came from him seeing the thing that everybody saw as a problem as the opportunity, and he'd flip the whole thing around. Today, our fellow citizens our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. They're not cowards. They're brave. They're believers. And they probably believe what they believe more than we believe what we believe. As I looked into that mess, we just started seeking God to lead us in what we should do. This problem would never be solved with bombs and bullets and blood. For centuries, bombs, bullets, and blood has been shed and shot. But the only way this was ever going to find an answer, it was going to be if people's hearts were changed. And there was a question, and it really seemed to me the Holy Spirit posed to my own heart. Are the Muslims the enemy or the prize? And deep inside my soul, I heard God say, I sent my son for them. He died for them. You know, everybody else was scared to even go after him, you know, and Buddy wasn't scared. And that started a journey. Uh, there were folks that, because of that, left the church. We had to look in the mirror. Because, yeah, as leaders, you, you always have to ask that question. Are there legitimate things we're not doing that's causing it? We had people getting upset with us the whole time. I look at the map and I look at Pakistan. I've been there. I've been in those mountains. I know those places. I know those faces. And I hear people say sometimes, we ought to just put a bomb in it and blow it all. You don't know those kids. <laughs> I want those kids. I want those kids to know Jesus. To reach the Muslim people requires relationship. You don't have any equity with somebody you don't know until you build that equity with a relationship, and that takes time, which we made a lot of mistakes. You know, we had young people that got black eyes in Speaker's Corner in, in, in London, England. We were like, okay, that's the wrong process. What is the right process? Because Buddy was, I think, a, a, a learner, he had that kind of commitment. We decided that the 
way we should do this is the way Jesus did it, incarnationally. The way we should do it is the way Paul did it, find common ground. And as we decided to really reshape our approach to the Muslim world, what we found was fruit. And God was already at work, and we weren't really going to do a work for God. We were joining in a work He was already doing. And we have to ask ourselves, if our heart is not broken by that which breaks the heart of God, then we need to pray and ask God to give us His heart, because His heart is for the world. In learning how to humble ourselves and engage the Muslim community with the good news of the kingdom of God, it actually transforms the way we interact with all communities. <laughs> We were under the radar for 17 years, but he knew that it was going to take that long, and he was okay with it. And then it began to grow and multiply. Was started with Grace Noble, 1983, grows kind of as a, as a small church for a while, has this explosion of youth in the 2000s and it's pressing on the edges of a mega church. The congregation had outstripped the capacity for seating. Every Sunday we watched cars drive into the parking lot, circle around and then leave because there wasn't even parking spots for them. Buddy and the team had a decision to make of do we want to become a mega church or do we want to multiply and plant churches? They had building plans set up for across the street and all these things. And after much prayer and conversation, they felt like they were supposed to multiply instead of become a megachurch. A little old Baptist church just a block away from Georgia Tech calls up and says, hey, our congregation has moved outside the perimeter. Nobody's really gathering here. Do you think you could come in and help us reach the next generation? Well, that became Grace Midtown. I remember people not even wanting to go down to Midtown. I mean, it was not a cool place to be. It was an answer to the 2001 of 9-11. We were going to go down and be close to a mosque. Constantly having that tension. This is a college town. This is a college area. And dad being like, no, this is where God has called me to be. We actually ended up reaching the college kids. There was a guy who would drive in from Monroe and he loved the church and his family loved the church. He said, we have this dream for a church like Grace that would teach the Bible and make disciples where we could walk to it. And we happen to have this cotton mill, like could you use an old bay of the cotton mill and could we start a church out there? And so 2010, Grace Monroe was born. We couldn't ever get more seats at Snellville, but all along the way, God kept opening doors for us to plant these other churches. But we had planted Midtown, we planted Monroe, we had some dreams for Grace Athens that was just getting off the ground and we get word that Buddy's on the way to the hospital. I remember getting up to preach that following Sunday, and I needed to give the update to the congregation. At that point, we really didn't know much about the outlook. Kind of got the update that this really could be a fatal uh, injury, fatal surgery, that he might not come out. We didn't know at the time, we just knew something was happening in his heart, he was having kind of an episode. I remember mom waking us up. It was earlier in the morning. Like, we need to get him to a hospital now. Nurse took his vitals. And when the nurse took his vitals, like he was talking to her and she was like, there's no possible way that he's talking and these are his vitals, you know? Like, he should be dead right now. I also felt this responsibility. We're going to teach the scriptures. Buddy uses that phrase, defiant worship. In the face of tragedy, in the face of disaster, that we worship God defiantly. They had had him in surgery all day. 
So the doctor had said when he came in, I don't expect him to respond if he doesn't wake up in a week or two. It may take a month. And even then, there was a sense of, and he might not make it. And I remember, you know, a bunch of people just kind of drove up there to the hospital. And we were all just kind of in the lobby. And Jody came out and found us, but she kind of snuck us in uh, back into the ICU. And he was just laying there. He clinically was dead for over 40 minutes. I put my hand on his foot, and we just started praying. God, save his life. God, heal him. And I could feel his foot twitch. And then he started kind of making a noise, and there was a nurse standing off to the side. Hey, he's, he's moving. Is that expected? And she flipped out. It felt like we literally watched a man come back to life, like resurrection. I feel like the spirit just does what it wants. Those born of the spirit are, are moved like the wind. And so the spirit, I feel like, is always doing this wild thing. Here's what pioneers do. They hear the word of the Lord, and then they act. They act decisively and urgently. I think everybody's instincts kind of kicked in, like, all right, buddy's down, but like, we're moving forward, you know? Like, I mean, that's kind of how he had trained us up. Here's what God's saying, let's go for it. But as this was unfolding, it made sense that those young men that lived in our basement became pastors of those places. And so they were already kind of in place and ready to roll on these churches. How the church is, sometimes has to wait and sometimes has to go. And Jesus says, hey, hang out in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere until the Spirit comes. And then when it comes, you go. Discipleship look like for, look like for us here. It looks like befriending people and building that kind of trust, that kind of friendship, where you can accompany them and you can ask questions and they can be completely honest with you. And I remember the next church was Grace New Hope. He realized that if he came back, he could leave Grace and he would go out and get the people started because he had the name and the reputation. Then he would get it to the point that it was a healthy, growing, sustainable place. And he let somebody else come in and take that one. Again, like you wouldn't leave it if it wasn't in a healthy place. But he was in a healthy place, so he could leave it to these younger guys to teach. And so we kind of, it was easy to stir Buddy up at that point. We just instigated there's next churches. Like, come on, don't you want to just do it? And he wouldn't be able to hold back on that. Uh, there was a whole house church and a group of leaders at Grace Midtown. And I was like, where are these people at? I haven't seen them at church. So I started talking to them. They're like, well, we live up here in Marietta. So our life isn't really integrated. Like, is there a way we could start a church up here? And he said, hey, you don't happen to know of a church building up your way that we could rent on Sunday nights or something. And he goes, actually, I do. There it was. There was Grace Marietta. People decide, I'm not going to be inactive anymore. I'm going to get engaged. And I remember like telling him, hey, we think we're supposed to go plant a Grace Church in DC. The reason why Paul in the book of Acts ends his life in Rome because he knew if you want to reach the world, you've got to go through the very center of the world, which was in his day Rome. Well, that's Washington, D.C. We believe in Chris and Jess. How many of you know them? We believe in them. Listen, I know, Jody knows what it's like to go to a place and start a church and not have any help. And I'm gonna tell you something, it is doggone hard. When we came up here, we saw where we could both thrive in our unique callings with Chris starting a church in the heart of the nation's capital. And then for me to continue to pursue science, I'm seeing action on, on climate change. Right now, on the other side, in DC, there's an empty heart. And they're saying, boy, why can't there be a a, a, a church that expositionally opens the scripture. You know, I, I don't think it was about the Grace brand. Buddy did not care about that at all. I think he just, two things, I think he genuinely wanted to see younger leaders succeed and give them opportunities. And I think he believed in the mission. Wow, I wish I was going with you. I might.
Hey, don't 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 You're tell me they don't they don't need me around here anymore. You're welcome. Buddy. <laughs> For the four years from 2013, he was really healthy. His arteries were still dissected, like they weren't flowing right. Every six months we would go in for a sonogram. I take him one day to the hospital to get a shot. We go in, there's something wrong. The doctor comes in and he says, buddy, we need to fly you to Houston and have all of your arteries replaced. And Buddy said, I'm not doing that. I've already read about this. I know what, what this is. There's five organs. I have five times greater chance of having a stroke. I'm not going to do this. And he said, if you don't do this, my only alternative is to send you home on hospice. And he said, you'll be sending me home on hospice. I'm OK with that. They said, at most, you have 30 days. <laughs> you have the cutest smile. Do you know that? It is just winsome. Can you say winsome? Huh? You know, I have no fear <laughs> of dying. I do have a fear of living for things that don't matter. And they had 30 days to live. And it was shocking because we all believed he was invincible. It was hard to see him in his earthly body. But knowing that Earth has no power over us if we believe. And heaven, like he said, is actually very, very real. So I'm holding him in this fine and white linens of his bedding. And I said, buddy, you're about to be the bride. You're gonna go be the bride. I'll see you at the marriage supper. And he begins to sing, hallelujah. In his pain, he's holding me. His very last words are scripture. What do you mean by that? If you just answer the, the issues of the culture, if you, just, um, if you just go to the to the loudest need and you don't build up leaders and you don't make disciples, there'll be nobody left in the next generation to go to the ones that have needs. And even when he didn't have voice to say it, we knew what it, we knew what he meant. So I keep this on my phone. Um, I keep this on my phone. We do not know how long we're going to have to serve the Lord. We do not know how long we're going to have. I've often thought that, you know, I, I, I suppose, God willing, the Lord doesn't come back. I may live to be 80 or 90. I don't think so, though. I really don't think so. I believe if you look at the world situation, you can see the whole thing coming down to a culmination. But let me tell you something else. You never know when your time is going to come and knock on that door. A 
the uncertainty that we're living through and the ways that we all have to step up into being the church is so much bigger than than dad and that's what made him want to be a part of the story and to tell the story and to um, see what it is that God is doing because uh, it's such a better story than whatever it is that you can imagine. Because it's always been about a, a movement, not just an organization, and about empowering people to step into who God's called them to be and what God's made them to do, multiplying God's work in people's life. I mean, it's not Buddy's model, right? It's Jesus' model. You know, Jesus invited a handful of guys alongside of him and walked this thing out, and then Jesus was gone, and the thing multiplied through the lives of these guys who are now following the Spirit on their own and remembering the things that Jesus taught and did. This is not about us growing something. This is about allowing God to move through us. I mean, Jesus said, like, you believe in me, you're going to do the things that I've done, and you'll actually do greater things. So the greatest person who ever lived wanted to be surpassed, and he was. Like the fact that when Jesus left, things actually exploded and took off. And that's really what Buddy, in the last, I think in the last probably 15, 20 years, what he really started orienting his future around was, I don't want to just grow this thing bigger and bigger. I want to position my life, and I want to invest my life so that once I'm gone, this doesn't, not only does this not uh, disappear, it actually exponentially begins to increase. Ultimately, it's not about Buddy, it's about Jesus and His Word meeting us and giving us life. But when I think about why Buddy may have died when he died, I think about what Jesus said about the seed, that unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, it can't bear fruit. And I don't want to hyper-spiritualize Buddy's death, but I do think that out of his death, there has been much fruit. And many things have sprung up and grown, and that's part of the wisdom of God. All Buddy was trying to do is just simply what he saw Jesus do, which means it's not about us trying to keep doing what Buddy did. It's just Buddy kept pointing to Jesus, and now we keep looking at Jesus and going, all right, if that's what he did, that's what we're going to do. As a whole church, he knew that everything was okay, and everybody was in place, and everybody was at the right place, and that they could carry on without him. That really was something that he believed, like you don't go when everything is bad. You can only leave something when everything is going well. If the next generation is going to be reached, you're the ones that are going to have to do it. You're the ones that are going to have to do it. Their spiritual livelihood, their spiritual existence is in your hands. My question to you is, are you in? after Buddy's death, it wasn't even just that the church plateaued. Every Grace Church grew in that next season. We got to watch that happen as he released the ministry to us and empowered us. And then Buddy's no longer here, but he had set up that next generation to carry this thing forward. I'm about to be 20 years old on Sunday, and I actually believe I have the power and the ability and like the capability with the Lord to like actually change the world. And I think without Buddy giving me that idea or just grace as a whole, giving me the opportunities and empowering me to do those things, there's just no way that that would be happening. And I can say the same thing. I have tons of friends that I have from Grace that I'm like, you're all gonna change the world. Um, and I think a big reason for that is Grace showing us 
that we're able to do that and we have the capabilities to do that and empowering us to do that in the same space. And at Grace, I started learning that the Church of God is everywhere. It doesn't matter you're white, black, Indian, Korean, Hispanic. If you're really a part of, of, of the Church of God, you, you, you can really enjoy the grace of the Lord, the church. They saved my marriage. I, I, people always talk about Buddy, this guy who founded the church. And I wish I knew him. I know I want to see him again, but I, I wanted to tell him thank you because the day he decided to open that church, that day, my marriage was saved by grace. And that was something that was really heavy on our hearts, like, are we really going to find a church? And then we went there, the Grace Capital City, and it was amazing. Yeah, and we knew that this, this is home. People at Grace, they really accept you as you are, and so I think this is a church yep. where people that wouldn't normally be invited into family can find family, and that like radical acceptance kind of changes their life. It's just a good church. It's pursued me in every different life stage, high school, college, post-grad, young married. There's always been a chance for me to be a part of this family. Kingdom dreams are not just for the church, they're for us as individuals. And so rather than the pastor standing up in front of the congregation and saying, here's our dream, I need you to sign up, and here's 12 different ways you can serve, my dream or our dream or those kinds of things. It's the equipping of everybody in the room has a kingdom dream and God has anointed you and gifted you and placed passions and emotions and giftedness in your life and we want to help make those kingdom dreams come to life. Shake the heavens, you stir up.